as we've been talking about over the last two weeks, anger is not that healthy of an emotion. In fact, as we've said before, and we'll quote again here from Epictetus, any person capable of angering you becomes your master. He can anger you only when you permit yourself to be disturbed by him. Hello, welcome to the Painted Porch Book Club. We are Painted Porch Strategies. I'm Amy Akowski. I'm here with Sierra Ram Cantrell and Rob Hunter. And we're a training and advisory team that is dedicated to the idea that you can be the architect of your life and the master of your mindset by learning to harness three core skills for you to be able to be successful and thrive in this ever-changing world of life and work. And that is mindfulness or self-awareness, communication, and collaborative teamwork and relationships. So here on our book club, we are here in week three of reviewing and talking about this book, Unoffendable, The Art of Thriving in a World Full of Jerks by Einzelganger. And we are here rounding out our book club for this particular book and continuing on this theme of how can we not get stirred up? How can we not get angry? How can we not become someone else's puppet, as Epictetus says, where they become our master? And so we're going to round this out as we're learning all of these ways to become unoffendable. And as we continue on this path this week, we're looking at how to, as Elsa would say, let it go. <laughs> how do we let those offenses, those irks, those triggers, those moments, how can we learn to let them go and find ways to be able to still recognize and be true to ourselves, but not let anger get the better of us. So in this first chapter, all about how to let go, I love how he starts. He talks about the idea of our mind. And this has been a theme throughout this book and also a big thing with the Stoics. The mind can play tricks on you, as Rob Hunter likes to say in his Master Your Message program. And he talks about the idea how the mind is basically like spam. <laughs> and when it comes to negative thoughts, that spam, those spam messages can come in and the untrained mind will just keep opening and clicking on those spam messages, thereby furthering the pain, maybe contributing to a Nigerian prince, you know, to help free him from his shackles. So I wanted to first talk, get, get, your, get your perspective from both of you about this idea of spam and, you know, how maybe we, we each have maybe let some spam come in in our lives and how we're trying to be better of not, not reading the spam messages. Yeah, I love the analogy of the spam because I think in modern times it speaks directly. Like it's not, it's not always like in your face, but like it's there. It's it's in your spam box or in your regular email, and you just keep seeing it. You know, it's an interesting terminology. A lot of times, Rob refers to it as old stories um, that you've you know handed down. Um, you know, the the Buddhists would say like that there's some karma possibly that that's there, um, but, but it is it's true. Like you have to have a filter. Mm -hmm. I think of it more like your mind is like an untamed horse that you have to break. You got to work with it and you got to work with it and you got to work with it until you take control of the horse. That's your mind. It wants to run free and eat spam and, you know, consume all these negative things just to get in your way. And you have to take control of it. And he talks a lot about that as we get towards the end of the book is he took basically what? He stopped dating. He stopped drinking. He stopped going to bars and he spent a lot of time looking into himself that was the pandemic for me like everybody oh, i'm like man that was the greatest time because it forced me to slow down and i use that as an opportunity to really dig in and really look at what kind of spam is affecting my wild horse of a mind mm -hmm. yeah and then beyond the spam he then he talks about this idea of your shadow and this is actually a carl jung concept where he talks about how all of us have this shadow. And we touched on this really early, right at the beginning of the book, about thinking about what is triggering us and why. 
what is the underlying reason or, or source that is causing us to react in this way? Is it because of maybe something that we're ashamed about, a, the shadow that we're trying to repress? Is it something that we haven't quite fully reconciled with, maybe a past pain or a past feeling or experience that we haven't quite worked through? And I love how he talks about how we try so hard to hide that shadow, to suppress it, to kind of keep it at bay. And when we do that, we're putting on a mask. And the problem is that at some point, that shadow is going to want to pop out. It's going to it's going to want its presence to be seen unless we are willing to accept and recognize that that shadow is a part of us and actually have it be something that we always carry along with us and not try to hide. And one of the things that he talks about with that is a way to kind of better reconcile with your shadow or to get comfortable with your shadow or even find out what maybe your shadow might be harnessing or holding is through the power of meditation. And so Sierra, you being our chief joy officer, our mindfulness expert, Sherpa and coach, and our master of meditation, I wanted to get some of your thoughts on what what types of meditations or is there something that you might recommend that might help someone if they need to take a little time to just sit with and get to know their shadow a little bit more so that they become a little bit more comfortable with them in the long run? So, uh, yes, definitely. Meditation is a really helpful tool. I think a lot of us don't meditate because we think it has to be hard. So I'm here to tell you, if I, if I tell you one thing, remember is don't make it hard. Literally just be somewhere and just don't do anything. Just get quiet, focus in on your breathing and just be there and just listen. Um, we think it's this really complicated mystical thing, but it's really just bringing your attention inside and um, listening. So if you just go somewhere, a lot of us think of sitting, but you don't have to sit. You can lay down, you can stand up, you can walk and just start bringing your attention in and then just listen and see what happens. It also doesn't have to be long is if you want to start a meditation practice, start with five, literally five minutes. I don't mean like kind of five minutes. I mean, set a timer on your cell phone so that it goes off at the end of five minutes and just be quiet for a little bit. Now, if you want to do deep work, getting into your shadow, okay, you're going to probably need to do this five minutes pretty frequently in order to get there or start with five work in and you're just going to start to get to know yourself. What he's talking about with the shadow is you can't forever run from it and expect to have a healthy relationship. You're going to have to accept that the shadow is a part of you. You're going to have to actually like look the shadow in the face and figure out what to do. For him, uh, he, he talks a lot throughout the whole book about how he has this complex about the way he looks a little Middle Eastern or he looks a little ethnic. And he talks about how this consistently like gets under his skin. And then finally, I think part of the way he resolved this shadow is he became friends with another guy who looks on the similar side to him. And he sort of made peace with that because the reason why it upset him was I think because he had a prejudice about what that meant. So in order to like be friends with the shadow, he had to literally be friends with somebody and get to a place where it no longer had any negative connotation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You know, it also makes me think in addition to the meditation, you know, it's, it's a multi-step process to be able to, first of all, recognize that self-awareness, that mindfulness, right? That meditation can bring. What is my shadow? What What is my shadow consisting of? What What is it carrying around? And then that next phase is actually then doing a little bit of a breakdown of why is it that way? And how am I reacting because of that shadow? And that makes me think, obviously, Rob, of one of your prime prime tools that you have in Master Your Message, which is writing a rap. So the rap process was the process that I've used to do this work. So meditation is great. 
it's absolutely wonderful, especially because it can help you start a wrap process. So you can do it in two different ways. You can do it sitting still and, and in the moment, write your wrap. R in the wrap is recognize. So recognize what's going on. Recognize what, what is happening. And then the A in wrap is assess. You assess what's going on. Like, where are you feeling it in your body? Dig into it a little bit. And then the P is the most important part. That's the processing part. This is the part that sometimes takes time. Like sometimes it takes me a whole weekend to process one thing but I set that weekend aside and give myself the time to really work through it. Journal, take notes, whatever your process is, that's my process. So you can use meditation to do it, or you can do a rap, write a rap in a moment. Like if you're in a traffic and someone cut you off, you're like, whoa, okay, recognize someone just cut you off. Assess that you're feeling angry about it. Why are you feeling angry about it? That's that process. And what I discovered in that is for me, it's fear. So you know, Sierra likes to say this too. There's two types of emotions, love emotions and fear emotions. Fear is incredibly strong, so are love, but fear can override everything because your survival instinct kicks in. So now that I understand that, oh, there's an element of fear at play when I'm driving, I'm better able to adapt to the situation because I understand what my body and my mind and that wild horse is doing in my head. But I'm like, nope, I'm going to take you this way. We're not going to go where you want to go. I'm in control. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And ultimately those fears and those judgments, those are all parts of what Carl Jung would say are our shadow. And it's really important to be able to take the time to, through meditation and mindfulness, be able to recognize what it is. And then using a tool like Rob's wrap from Master Your Message, then be able to assess and process and then decide what am I going to do with this information? Am I going to continue to suffer? <clears throat> or am I going to maybe try to flip the script and come up with a new way to think about this or a new way to approach it like Einzelganger did with uh, his, his, his own shame or his own trigger about his, the color of his skin. How am I going to work through that? What, what, outlets, what avenues, what exercises am I going to perform so I can then let it go, right? Which is really what they're trying, what they're trying to uh, encourage here. With those judgments, you know, a lot of what, and he mentions it here, but a lot of what the Stoics really focus on and the Buddhists is the idea of what are we attaching ourselves to? What are we attaching our happiness, our joy, our contentment to? Are they things that are within our control or are they things that are outside of our control? And he reminds us here that we are conditioned as a people very often to look for outside rewards, outside factors that help validate who we are, that can hide our mask, right, our shadow. Um, but it's really important that, that we don't seek happiness or seek fulfillment outside of ourselves. You know, it makes me think, the the ought to's you know we talk about the shoulds a lot i i'm a i'm a big shudder <laughs> i'm it's one thing that i'm working through a lot in my life is the shoulds the expectations of how things should be how people should be how this event should have happened or not and and i get i get that in my mind and that can trip me up but the reality is it's not within my control right it's those those outside factors are not within my control i had a a former colleague of mine uh, who was funny. He he used to say, everywhere I go, I taught myself to drink black coffee. This is a perfect analogy. I, I taught myself to drink black coffee because then wherever you go, you're never disappointed. <laughs> ah. Because there's a lot of places you could go where maybe they don't have cream, they don't have sugar, they don't have the different accoutrement that you want. It's not Starbucks. So if you drink black coffee, you're never disappointed. And it's that idea of how how high are you setting your expectations, the bar? How much weight are you putting on those external factors? So that way you learn ways to better balance the the shadow from the light. Well, just like the out. coffee, right? The point yeah. is you can train yourself to do anything you want. It's just a question of whether or not you want to do it. Mm -hmm. But you should do this work. Speaking of shoulds. <laughs> But oh, that, that's a good yes, but it, it, that's the point. The, the point that he brings up really throughout the whole book is the concept of self-freedom, right? To not be held captive by someone else's words or not be held captive by, you know, shoulds. This should be this way. 
to not be held captive by things that are not in your control. Because when you find your center, you find your control, that is when you are free. And that is when you have the best chance to be happy, no matter the circumstances. Yes. Uh, because if you peg your happiness on what other people do or your expectations of other people or the quality of the coffee creamer, if it's not wow. just so, you're setting yourself up to be unhappy. You're, you're choosing that unhappiness, right? You, all of a sudden, you, it's not perfect, so forget it. You know, all of a sudden, it's just become horrible. No, like, you're making that choice. So, to his point, if he's choosing something that he knows almost all the time, at least in this country, that there is going to be black coffee available, okay, you know what? Cool. This is as long as there's oxygen for me to breathe, as long as there's black coffee, then I'm going to be good. And now the possibilities of, of you having a great day have just gone way up. <laughs> mm -hmm. The last thing I want to touch on in this particular chapter as we round this out is understanding the idea of letting it go and recognizing the impermanence of everything including ourselves, even though that's something that we don't necessarily like to always reconcile with. Uh, the reality is that nothing lasts, nothing is permanent. And this bad moment, this bad situation, granted, you know, there's different levels. He does talk about if you're in a very, if you're in a, a dangerous situation, yes, you definitely need to, to take action. You don't just want to be passive and let it go. <laughs> um, but recognizing the impermanence of the moment, of the situation, of the bad feeling, of the, the, you know, the, the thoughts, the judgments, the embarrassment, whatever it might be, recognizing that it will not last. This will not last. It will pass. And I love the story that he added at the the end of this chapter about the Sufi king, uh, who, uh, do, do either of you want to talk about that? Go ahead. Okay. All right. So what he does is he does, he tells this little story of a Sufi king and how he definitely rode the waves of happiness and misery based on the prosperity of his kingdom. So when his kingdom was doing really well, he was happy. He was joyful. There were celebrations. Everything was great. When the kingdom was not doing so well, he was in a funk. And he went to his priests and he said, I would like you to help me. I want you to help me and create a, a magical ring that when I am in a funk, because I don't want to be in this funk, I don't want to be in this mood, I want to be more content, more happy, more joyful. When I'm in this funk, I'd like a magical ring that can help me get out of it. And the beauty of it is that this magical ring that they created for him was a simple ring that just had a phrase on it that said, this too shall pass. And it was a beautiful mm -hmm. way to, to, to remind himself the magic of the reminder, right? It wasn't anything beyond that and recognizing that, you know what, when you're in the, when you're having a, when you're struggling with something or when you're feeling low or feeling doubtful or fearful or uncertain or feeling judged or whatever it might be, recognize that this too shall pass. Words of wisdom for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So speaking of uh, this two shall pass, now we're going to talk about trolls. <laughs> and that's in chapter eight, he talks about uh, the wonderful world of online trolls. They exist. We cannot block them. It goes back to one of the fundamental things he said right at the beginning. We could turn off the comments on the entire World Wide Web, but you know what? Trolls will still exist. And in some ways, we can we can welcome them but we can also learn from them and learn how to navigate this world of trolls. So Rob, as someone who is a public figure on the radio, <laughs> I know that you have had your share of trolls that you've bumped into. What have you learned from them and how have you learned to navigate around them? <laughs> I switched the story. So it, I had a story that, oh my God, every one of those people who was trolling me is right. I am an idiot. Oh, I was wrong on that one. What I now understand is that trolls, when trolling, reveal themselves. It has nothing to do with you. And if there is something that is true, you go back to the very beginning of Einzelganger's book. Is it true? Yes. 
if it's true, why be offended by the truth? That's it. Sometimes trolls have brought up a good point. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's interesting. I will use that as feedback. And then I move on. And, you know, after 22 years of being trolled one way or another, you, you know, you develop that thick skin. And it, just having that basis of knowledge going back to that point that what you say reveals more about you than it does the other person. And it lets me, not always, much of the time, think before I speak. What am I revealing about myself when I speak? So that is how I've turned trolls into a neutral zone, I guess I would say. A DMZ, a demilitarized zone, if you will. <laughs> Have you learned from them at all? Because I sometimes, yes. it, beyond revealing maybe some of their shadow that you know some of their shadow that they're bringing along are there instances where maybe you've learned a little bit from them about how to present something differently or sometimes i've been known to maybe cut a corner or two and make the opinion go a little bit up a little bit or whatever and sometimes people call you out for that and i'm like okay that's a good point so they can check you oh absolutely they can serve as a check a check on the ego, a check on... Well, that's what I do first. I yeah. try to feel, does it sting? Okay, why does it sting? And then I'm like, okay, is is there anything out of this that I can get value from? Mm -hmm. And I, sometimes, yes. Sometimes it's just someone who disagrees with you and saying it in an angry way. Because you have to, you know, when you're in the opinion business, which I'm in, you're going to get people that have the opposite opinions that are going to call you names simply because they don't like your opinion. So if it's just that, you just brush it aside. Like, okay, that's great. But if it's like, hey, here's a critique, not a criticism, but a critique, you go, okay, let me think about that. And well, I'm okay digging into that. There's another way to look at it too, a way that I, I know that Einzelganger talks about a little bit. He talks about like when it comes to like teasing, for example, with with live people, is like on in one way, like the person cared enough to interact with you cared enough to you know either was listening to you on the radio i know i remember there's a famous quote i think it's howard stern that if people love me or hate me they're still tuning in they're still they're listening to me right so you could look at it as a flattery if you will like because a lot of times people really don't give a shit out of, about you they're just not going to do anything like you know the death stare or the ignore or the you know ghost you but in one way you could think like wow, this person actually, I made enough of an impact to, for that person to even have an opinion. Mm -hmm. That is also true. Yeah. And then he touches on, he, he, he brings us back and he reminds us of one of the, one of my favorite quotes from Marcus Aurelius about recognizing that you are going to encounter jerks and trolls. And he says a-holes as well. You're going to encounter them. You can't, there's, there's no pill. Sometimes I am one. <laughs> yes. That happens. We, yeah. we all, we all sometimes yep. can become one. That's why we're practicing. Exactly. <laughs> That's why yeah. we're reading yeah. these books and trying mm -hmm. to learn how to be better. Exactly. Um, but recognizing that you are going to encounter these different types of people. You know, it's, it's Marcus's famous quote. When you get up in the morning, recognize that you're going to encounter jerks, fools, you know, idiots, whatever, whatever it is. And understanding that they do so because they they don't know good from evil. And it said another way, they have their baggage, they have their shadow. Well, and then he very seamlessly takes us from that to this uh, core store principle called premeditatio malorum, which is planning for the worst. Mm -hmm. So he says, okay, if you can accept the fact that, you know, the trolls are are there will i love how he even says i thought when i was a kid that like kids grew out of that no so if you know that it exists if you know that it's a reality and you know that there's a strong possibility that you're going to encounter that or perceptively encounter that throughout your days make a plan like plan ahead for what are you going to do are you going to do the blank stare are you going to do the ignore are you going to do the confront hey that's not right that's not true what are you going to do? Make a plan. So that way it doesn't surprise you. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Don't feed the trolls. Prepare to encounter them and then have some tools like the ones that he mentioned and we've mentioned here, whether it's 
you know, practicing with negativity, recognizing the yin and the yang, the balance of things that you need the one to balance the other, ignoring them, giving them that blank stare so that they become uncomfortable. We talked about with stoicism, it's be the rock. So if someone's yelling at a rock, they're the ones that look like the fool, not the person that's being yelled at. And then have that self-deprecating humor. Maybe that's another one that you employ. Again, like Epictetus says, you know, if, if you know, he's insulting me about this, if he really knew me, he would know about X, Y, Z as well. Yeah. All of those different examples of things that you can employ to help not feed the trolls and not let the trolls become your master and you their puppet. So we round this out and he really just talks about the idea of all of this requires exercising courage and courage is not, you know, uh, it, it's not fearlessly without thinking about the consequence. It's knowing the consequence and doing it anyway, having the, having the bravery and the courage to be more virtuous, to not let, not to not get triggered to doing that inner work to remove your mask and befriend your shadow. And so I wanted to, from both of you, just get any final thoughts on this book, this section, overall, some of your takeaways that, that you're going to take with you so that you can be less unoffendable in a world full of jerks. Sir? So there's a perfect example of this. I think part of where society has gone a little bit wrong University of Michigan, there was a speaker welcoming medical students into the program. And this teacher, professor, who's also a doctor, has some views that some in the student's body did not agree with. So they walked out. And it was seen as courageous. So oh, big coming together. I'm like, no, that's the exact opposite of what Angel Zanger is talking about. That is actually cowardice. You're walking away from something that challenges you. You got to stay in that fight because if you use that metaphor, right, walking out of the auditorium and the speech wasn't even about that controversial issue, but they walked out anyways as a symbol. We do that in our own lives. Something challenges us, we walk away. Instead of staying in there into the auditorium and confronting what is making us uncomfortable and learning more about why someone else's opinion about something else might make us uncomfortable. But of course, we live in a social media world too, where it is very tempting to stage moments for the, the likes and the retweets. Moments so, of offense. Yes, but I found that to be exactly in parallel to the last chapter in Einzel Ganger's book is, if you're walking out, you are not unoffendable. Staying in means you're unoffendable. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Um, I found this book really, really helpful and really informational. I love that he is a student of both Stoicism and Buddhism, um, two things which are near and dear to my heart. I love the juxtaposition that he talks about. Um, he's he's a, a guy that lives in the Netherlands, and so there's a lot of like cultural things that he's explaining that were new for me. So so that was a really cool discovery. It was different than like an American take. Um, I found it really helpful. He brought some things to light to me that like especially with the trolling and the types of um, negative that I, I had never thought of in that way. He he laid some of those things out in a, in a way that was new for me. So I, I learned a lot and um, he definitely touched on a ton of the Stoic principles that we talk about over and over and over again. The dichotomy of control and premeditatio malorum being two of the heavy hitters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I love this book. A lot of it was a great refresher for many of the stoic concepts that we have been studying over time, especially in our 52 week journey that we went on together. But along with that, he also brought some additional things to light. I think one of the big things was recognizing that trying to create an unoffendable world is impossible. And it's not just impossible because each of us are unique beings with unique opinions and voices. But it, he, even beyond that, he, he brought to light the fact of each culture 
each different, each nation, they have their own rites and rituals and traditions. And so trying to navigate and to not offend this vast range of people on a daily basis, since we are, especially in the world today of the internet, we are a global society. We're not just isolated to our own little nation or our own little cultures village. anymore. Yeah, we're not yeah. in our own village. Our village is the world, mm -hmm. at least from a communication perspective. So yes, we should gain tools that teach us how to be more effective communicators. But along with that, also recognizing that we're never going to be able to be offense-free communicators simply because of the variations of cultures, traditions, people, mores, et cetera. So well, I think honestly, really it would be an incredibly boring world. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. He even talks about that right at the end. He talks about how you need that yin and that yang. You need the light and the dark. You need the positive and the negative. If everything is this, then nothing is, you don't have happiness. You don't have joy because everything is meh because you've stripped away mm -hmm. those extremes. You've stripped away that balance of the two of those, that ecosystem. You need them in order to recognize, you need a jerk to know when someone's being really nice. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you both so much for joining us on this journey and thank you to those of you who are watching who joined us as well we would love for you to share your comments what you got out of this maybe things that you enjoy things that maybe you didn't quite connect with share it with us in the comments here or even take it one step further and join us in our painted porch book club we do this pretty regularly uh, we meet we talk, we explore, we challenge one another, and we'd love for you to be a part of it as well as we continue on this journey of growth for ourselves, as well as how we show up in the world for one another. So thank you again. We are Painted Porch Strategies. If you want to find out more about us, our programs, and our community, go to paintedporchstrategies.com. And we hope to see you soon again on the Painted Porch. <laughs>